but you can just imagine it on the day, can't you? Under fire, ties his horse up, goes back to rescue Private Westwood. Bravery of the First Order. The Battle of Isandwana, one of the greatest British defeats of the colonial era. 20,000 Zulus came charging down these slopes and eventually overran the thin red line of British soldiers and their local allies. But did you know, despite the terrible British defeat, there were three Victoria Crosses awarded for actions that took place during the battle. Two of them posthumously. Today we're going to look at the stories of these men and their awards. And stay tuned till the end to find out about the mysterious, almost forgotten Victoria Cross recipient who was also killed during the battle. Private Samuel Wassell was a 21-year-old West Midlands lad who had been in the British Army since 1874. His regiment was the 80th, the Staffordshire Volunteers, but at the Battle of Isandwana he was attached to the Mounted Infantry. This was an ad hoc unit made up of infantrymen who knew how to ride a horse. On the afternoon of the battle, as the Zulu MP swept into the British camp, Wassel and a small group of his colleagues made a dash for it. As you can see here, the terrain around Isandwana is rocky and crisscrossed with dry water courses. Only those men on horseback had a chance of escaping. Here's Wassel's own account of what happened next. There was only one way to escape, which was by the Buffalo River, six or seven miles distant. We had to get across it back to our own territory in Natal. A main road led to the river, but it was cut off by the Zulus, and so I had to go across the felt. But I was not in the mood to care which way I went, so long as it took me away from the enemy. And so I furiously went on, stumbling over the rocky ground, expecting every instant that my horse, a Basutu pony, would fall. In that case, I should not have had a chance, for the Zulus would have been upon me before I could have got up again. To this day, I can't understand how a living soul got away from Isandwana. But I did escape from the field of the massacre and reached the Zulu bank of the river and saw on the other side of the Natal territory where my only hope of safety lay. I knew how dangerous the river was. There was a current running six or seven miles an hour. As an aside, it was much worse than I'm showing on these pictures now. No ordinary man could swim it, but the Zulus had a curious way of using their elbows which made them able to get across. I think it means they would link their elbows and cross in a group. I was urging my horse to the other side when I heard a cry for help and saw a man of my own regiment, Private Westwood, was being carried away. He was struggling desperately and drowning. The Zulus were sweeping down to the riverbank, which I had just left, and there was a terrible temptation to go ahead and just save oneself. But I turned my horse around on the Zulu bank, got him there, dismounted, tied him to a tree, and then I struggled out to Westwood, got hold of him and struggled back to the horse with him. I scrambled up into the saddle, pulled Westwood after me, and plunged into the torrent again. And as I did so, the Zulus rushed up to the bank and let drive with their firearms and spears. But most mercifully, I escaped them all and with a thankful heart, urged my gallant horse up the steep bank on the Natal side. And then got him to go as hard as he could towards help my car about 15 miles away from his Isandwana. So as far as I can tell, the whirlpool would have been around here. Now you can't really see it now, it's quite calm today. The waters are very low. But you can just imagine it on the day, can't you? Under fire, ties his horse up, goes back to rescue Private Westwood, bravery of the First Order. Wassell continued fighting during the war and was present at that Battle of Alundi where the Zulus were finally defeated on the 4th of July, 1879. He received his award from Chelmsford's successor, Sir Garnet Wolseley, on the 11th of September, 1879. He was 22 years old at that time, the youngest serving soldier to hold the award. But it seems that this brave young warrior had had his fill of army life and shortly afterwards he left and moved to Barrow in Furness where he lived out the rest of his days. He died in 1927. By the way guys, I just want to interrupt really quickly to ask what do you think to this t-shirt? If you're half the man I think you are, then I know you're gonna love it. Well, I've just designed a few different t-shirts and sweaters etc that really reflect our shared interest in British military history. I'll be adding more designs over the next few weeks, so check out the links below or scan the QR codes that are currently on the screen. Every sale means an extra two quid or so for me to keep the channel and the podcast running. Okay guys, sorry for the interruption, let's get back to the film. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's look at the controversial VCs, the ones that will really get the comments section going. Lieutenants Tainmouth Melville and Neville Coghill. Both men served with the 1st Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. 
Coghill was 26 years old and during the invasion of Zululand he was an orderly officer to Colonel Glynn who commanded the central column. Before the Battle of Isandwana, Glynn had left the camp alongside Lord Chelmsford, but Coghill had badly twisted his knee the previous day while trying to catch a chicken and so he had stayed back to allow it to rest. Talk about bad luck. Melville was a 36 year old father of two from central London. He was Glynn's adjutant and considered a star for the future, a real stud one to watch. As the battle raged and it became clear that the British camp would soon fall to the Zulus, Lieutenant Melville took possession of the Queen's colour with a plan to escape with it and save it from falling into the hands of the enemy. As regular viewers of this channel will know, it's a terrible disgrace for British battalions to lose their colours, especially to the enemy. The soldiers of the 24th would have been particularly concerned due to the fact the regiment had twice lost colours before. Once during the Napoleonic Wars they had been forced to throw them overboard to avoid being captured by the French and then at the Battle of Chilianwala they had lost them fighting against the Sikhs. It is said that Lieutenant Colonel Poulain who was in charge at the camp ordered Melville to save the colours. It's time to save the colours. Yep, just like that. But in reality there is no proof of this. It is more likely that on his own initiative he took the Queen's colour from the guard tent with a view to unfurling it and using it as a rallying point for the battalion. Birdie would have soon realised that the battle was too far gone for that and defeat was now inevitable. With that in mind it's likely he made a split second decision to try and escape and save them. In fact they were in a heavy unwieldy leather case. They weren't flying in the wind as shown in the film Zulu Dawn. Melville would have found it hard going navigating this rough terrain on his horse while keeping hold of the colour. It was also incredibly hard for Coghill. He couldn't walk due to his injury and must have been terrified of being dehorsed. It seems the two men didn't travel side by side along the fugitive's trail, but by the time they reached the Buffalo River they were together. Lieutenant Walter Higginson, who survived the battle, later wrote an account of his time with Melville and Coghill. Many horses threw their riders coming down to the river and many as well as myself were thrown in it. Lieutenants Melville and Coghill were with me just as I put my horse in the river and poor Melville was also thrown. He held on tightly to the Queen's colours which he had taken from the battlefield when all was over and as he came down towards me he called out to me to catch hold of the pole. I did so and the force with which the current was running dragged me off the rock but fortunately into still water. Coghill who had got his horse over all right came riding down the bank to help Melville. As he put his horse in close to us, the Zulus, who were about 25 yards from us on the other bank, commenced firing at us in the water. Almost the first shot killed Coghill's horse, and on his getting clear of him we started for the bank. We managed to get out alright, and when we had got about 100 yards up the bank, two Zulus came after us. When they were within 30 yards, Melville and Coghill fired and killed them both. I was without arms of any kind, having lost my rifle and ammunition in the river, and I had no revolver. When we'd gone a few yards further, Melville said he could go no more and Coghill said the same. I don't think they imagined at this time there was anyone following us. When they stopped, I pushed on and on. Reaching the top of the hill, I found four Basutus with whom I escaped by holding on to the horse's tail. I never saw either of these ill-fated officers again. In the course of the fight, the colours had been lost, dragged away by the current down the river. We'll never know exactly what happened to Melville and Coghill next. All we know for sure is that they were killed more or less where their gravestones lie today on this steep slope on the Natal side of the Buffalo River. So it says here, in memory of Lieutenant and Adjutant T. Melville VC and Lieutenant N.J.A. Coghill VC. Good to see that the grave of Melville and Coghill is still visited, still remembered. Here's a reef from the South Wales borderers, now part of the Royal Welsh. There was a glimmer of good news for the British though. In February a patrol was sent out and amazingly managed to discover the Queen's colour of the first 24th down on the riverbank. It was an important discovery, though unlike in Alphonse de Neuville's painting, it wasn't found lying alongside the bodies of Melville and Coghill. Ok I hear you cry, so how were these two officers awarded the Victoria Cross given that in the 1870s there was no posthumous Victoria Cross available? At the time, desperate to salvage some glory from the terrible defeat, the British press had focused on the story of Melville and Coghill, amplifying the deed and calling for them to be recognised. Unable to award dead men the Victoria Cross, an announcement was made in the London Gazette that had Melville and Coghill survived, they would have been recommended to Her Majesty for the award of the Victoria Cross. In those days that was considered kind of the next best thing. But not everybody agreed with this position. Lord Chelmsford seemed uncertain in his letters, 
and his successor, Sir Garnet Wolseley, was outright hostile, saying that he was uncomfortable with the idea of officers escaping on horseback while their men on foot are killed. During the Boer War, the rules around posthumous Victoria Crosses were changed, and in 1907, after much petitioning, the VC was finally awarded to both Melville and Coghill. I'm interested to know how you feel about it. Let me know in the comments if you think these were deserved awards. Did they do the right thing, and was it incredibly brave of them to try and escape with a colour, or should they have stayed and died alongside the rest of the battalion? Okay, moving forward, I did promise I would tell you about the forgotten Victoria Cross recipient who died at the battle. Do you know who it is? Well, it's Private William Griffiths of Lieutenant Charlie Pope's G Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment. Regimental number 1056. He was awarded his Victoria Cross in what's quite strange circumstances. Perhaps today he would have been more likely to be awarded the George Cross rather than the Victoria Cross. He was one of a party of five soldiers who volunteered to rescue comrades stuck on the Andaman Islands. Here's an excerpt from the citation which makes it clear what I'm talking about. On the 7th of May 1867, they risked their lives in manning a boat and proceeding through a dangerous surf to the rescue of some of their comrades who formed part of an expedition which had been sent to the island of Little Amdaman by order of the Chief Commissioner of British Burma with the view of ascertaining the fate of the commander and seven of the crew of the ship Assam Valley who had landed there and were supposed to have been murdered by the natives. The officer who commanded the troops on the occasion reports about an hour later in the day, Dr. Douglas, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment, and four privates referred to gallantly manning the second gig made their way through the surf almost to the shore. But finding their boat was half filled with water, they retired. A second attempt made by Dr. Douglas and the party proved successful, five of them being safely passed through the surf to the boats outside. A third and last trip got the whole of the party left on the shore safe to the boats. It stated that Dr. Douglas accomplished these trips through the surf to the shore by no ordinary exertion. He stood in the bows of the boat and worked her in an intrepid and seaman-like manner, cool to a degree, as if what he was then doing was an ordinary act of everyday life. The four privates behaved in an equally cool and collected manner, rowing through the roughest surf when the slightest hesitation or want of pluck on the part of any one of them would have attended by the gravest results. It's reported that 17 officers and men were thus saved from what must otherwise have been a fearful risk, if not certainty of death. Not too much more is known about Griffiths. Obviously, he was killed at the Battle of Isandwana, and, like all of his comrades, is buried in an unmarked grave on the battlefield. His Victoria Cross itself is held by the Regimental Museum in Brecon. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe, as in the coming weeks I have lots more Isandwana content coming out, and you won't want to miss it. Alright guys, take care.